Hi, this is Robert Rapier, and this is R Squared Energy TV. On this week's episode, we've got questions about Poets Project Liberty and about Kior, and finally about waste heat generated in the production of electricity. So, first question What do you think about uh, Poet and Project Liberty? So, if you don't know, Poet is the largest ethanol producer in the world, based in the U.S., uh, produce a large fraction of the ethanol that's used in the U.S., and they have broke ground on a project adjacent to one of their ethanol plants, corn ethanol plants, to produce ethanol from cellulose. So the first thing I would say is if anybody can actually pull this off, they should be able to pull it off. They've got uh, a lot of experience in moving ethanol around and in the logistics and in uh, generally, you know, how an ethanol plant works. So it's not like somebody who's, uh, you know, some, some of the people who've tr tried to do cellulose ethanol really had no experience at all. So they've got a, they've got a leg up there. Um, there's some challenges they've got to overcome. One is that uh, cellulosic ethanol, I believe, will be absolutely more expensive to produce than corn ethanol. And corn ethanol is already, um, it's, it's a little bit disadvantaged since the, uh, the tax credit uh, was ended at the end of last year. So, um, you know, with gas prices going up, that's been, that's helped. That's helped the price differential. But E85, for instance, has been disadvantaged against gasoline for most of this year. So if you introduce cellulosic ethanol now, you already have a blend wall. So you're producing as much as can be, as is mandated to be blended in the gasoline supply. And now you're producing ethanol that costs a little bit more than corn ethanol. Um, there, there's a lot of disadvantages there. Uh, besides the technology, I mean, the, the, it, 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 there's more steps involved in producing cellulosic ethanol, and that'll be reflected in their capital cost, which will be higher. Um, you know, they, they call it a commercial plant. It's 20 million, supposed to produce 20 million gallons a year, initially ramping up to 25. That's 1,300 barrels a day. That's pretty small relative to, say, what a corn ethanol plant will produce. Um, their capital cost per daily barrel, not only because of the, uh, the cellulose ethanol, uh, the, the additional piece, but uh, because of the size are going to be pretty high. So, you know, I don't think this will be a money maker for them right away. It, it depends on, you know, they've got to get their biomass very cheaply. You know, the process really hinges upon whether there's actually enough lignin that's left over after they, they uh, extract the sugars from the cellulose. To, to run the process. Now they say there's going to be enough left over to run the process plus the corn ethanol plant next door. And if that's true, that's, uh, you know, that's, that, that would be a big, big advantage and, and a, a major synergy there that could actually make that work. Um, I, I'm skeptical that there'll be standalone, large standalone cellulosic ethanol plants anytime soon. I think it's just too costly to produce uh, too many steps. Uh, but, you know, in conjunction with their corn ethanol plants, which is the way they've done their first one, you know, it, it, it may work. I, I think it'll be not, not as profitable or maybe not profitable at all uh, as their corn ethanol. But, uh, you know, I give, them a, I give them a reasonable shot of being able to pull it off. Uh, they do have a website that uh, www.projectliberty.com that kind of goes through their process. And it's pretty interesting. And if you're interested in their process, I'd encourage you to go and, and have a look. Second question on Kior. Biofuels Digest reports that Kior selected Natchez, Mississippi as the site for its second plant because the site has river access for feedstock and product shipments and natural gas pipeline and electric power already on the site. Why does a plant that will produce renewable crude need access to a natural gas pipeline? So, uh, you know, there's, there's two possible reasons. One could be simply that it's cheaper to use natural gas to drive this process than it is to try to use their own oil. But one may be that their oil is simply unsuitable for use as power in the plant. Um, it could be that it's it's uh, maybe suitable, but but just a lot more expensive and more difficult to handle and difficult to deal with. Um, for example, corn ethanol in the U.S. primarily uses natural gas for power. Now they could use corn stover and waste biomass, but that would be quite a bit more expensive. So they make a choice there to go with natural gas, and that's the case in a lot with a lot of places where natural gas is just it just happens to be the cheapest option. But it also may be in some cases that a specific process simply can't run without cheap natural gas. I mean, cheap natural gas is an enabler for a lot of processes that we may not you know, think much about. Uh, it's hard to say where corn ethanol would be without natural gas prices being rock bottom right now, because corn prices are up a little bit. 
and natural gas is one of their major costs. And the fact that it's so low is helping keeping them is helping to keep them competitive. Um, it's I wouldn't say corn ethanol would disappear if natural gas prices shot up, but some processes might. And I don't know if Kior is in that category or not. But there are reasons that they may be using natural gas rather than the feedstock they, they are producing. It's probably, well, there's no doubt, it's going to be a lot more expensive. The renewable crude that they're making, um, the, the, let's call it renewable crude, it's not really crude oil, but it's a, it, the, the fuel that they're producing will be a lot more expensive than natural gas, and so that is a reason that they would use it. So last question. Um, about and it's about electrical power so since nuclear coal and other forms of fossil fuel power plants waste about 70 percent of the heat they create what are some of the other methods of electrical generation that do not create this waste heat in addition what can we do to utilize this wasted heat and if we can or don't use it will this waste heat do any significant harm to our environment in the future so it's true, there is a lot of waste heat generated in the production of electricity. Uh, some of the methods that don't produce waste heat, solar power, wind power, you know, some of those, uh, but anything with a heat engine is going to produce waste heat. Most of the time, you know, a lot of these plants are very isolated. You know, the people don't want power plants right in their midst. And so there aren't industrial users around that can use the hot water. The ideal usage would be, you know, hot water in a cold climate for homes or for industry or for, and, and the plants themselves will certainly utilize that hot water uh, as like boiler feed water and things like that to, to, to gain some of that heat so they don't have to heat the water up quite as much. But it'll be simply more than they can, than they can use. So, you know, if you got a nuclear plant, it's going to be out in the middle of nowhere. It's going to be far away from things. There's probably just not a better use of that heat than uh, just cooling it off or, or dumping it out in their, in their uh, cooling water ponds. So um, um, in that case, and, and, and will it do any significant harm to our environment? Uh, the amount of heat that they're dumping is pretty insignificant as far as the, the overall climate goes. So it, won't, it itself won't do any significant harm to the environment unless it's being dumped into, say, a, a, an open body of water. So if a nuclear plant is dumping water, which is, you know, clean water, it's not, uh, it's not contaminated, but it's warm or hot and it's going into a river or something, that could change, you know, that could, you know, change the, the, the wildlife the, 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 uh, that's, that's in the river. It could make it uh, harmful. I'm not aware that that's happening anywhere, uh, but that would be the only case I would see where it would actually do any harm to the environment is if it's going in an open body of water that, that has wildlife and that responds negatively to the, uh, you know, to the additional heat. But as far as climate, it's not going to make much difference at all. But yeah, generally the problem is just the place that you're generating the heat is not the place, is not close to, to users of heat. So that heat will continue to be wasted and, uh, that's, that's just the way it's always been. You know, it's, it's nice to have a, an industrial user next door that needs hot water, but that's just usually not the case. So with that, that's, that's, that's this week's episode. Thank you for tuning in.